So my name is Joel Verajak. I'm a senior system engineer at uh, Open Systems, um, and I work in the observability team. And what does Open Systems do? So we are actually, uh, let's say, a managed uh, connectivity company. So we offer um, managed network solutions. And so it's quite interesting, I think, to be here at KubeCon, which is a Kubernetes conference. Um, and we actually ship mostly, we work with these kind of boxes, these kind of devices. And we don't run Kubernetes on these devices. So maybe it's interesting to think, you know, why are we here in the first place? Um, we run quite a lot of these hosts. Currently, we have just over 10,000 um, situated all over the world. So they plug into all our customers' infrastructure. Um, but today, I'm not going to talk about how we monitor these hosts. It's sort of another topic entirely. If it sounds interesting, and it is interesting, um, there's a link here to a, to a talk I gave um, at KubeCon EU um, back in April, uh, where I go into more sort of details about this. Um, but today, uh, we're going to talk about Thanos. At least, I hope that's what everyone is expecting. Um, otherwise, I wrote my, my abstract very wrongly. Um, but in particular, what I would like to talk about is scalability, resilience, and performance of the right path. So for us, all of our metrics are sort of customer-facing. So if there are problems with the metrics, it comes back to us very, very quickly. You know, customers complain. Um, so we're really, really focused on making sure that we get every metric which is shipped to us from all of those devices. Um, and at the end, if there's time, um, there's sort of one weird trick that reduced storage costs for us by quite a significant number. Um, it was kind of an interesting uh, journey, let's say, debugging journey um, as to what was going wrong. Um, so hopefully we can get around to that as well. So hopefully most of you are aware of what Thanos is. If not, you will know what Prometheus is. Um, otherwise, I'll do my best to accommodate for everybody. Um, so Thanos is a framework which is built around Prometheus, okay? So it's, um, it's you know, Prometheus, of course, is the, the, the sort of de facto metrics backend for uh, most Kubernetes clusters. I think if you spin up a Kubernetes cluster today, uh, one of the first things you do is you go and install kubeprom stack to just get basic monitoring in place. Um, so Thanos is sort of wrapping around Prometheus and extending its capabilities. So it offers a global query view. Um, so this is really nice if you have multiple, uh, you know, maybe tens or hundreds of Kubernetes clusters which you want to look at metrics in one pane of glass. Um, Thanos can kind of plug into all of those different Prometheus. Um, it offers unlimited retention. So one of the, let's say, drawbacks of Prometheus is that you cannot have, um, you know, retention beyond, let's say, a few months. Otherwise, querying becomes sort of just unfeasible due to the decompression time. Um, it's inherently Prometheus compatible. Uh, and it also has some new features like downsampling, um, which yeah, actually enables the unlimited retention by sort of reducing the amount of time it takes to decompress long, uh, long lift samples or long life samples. So, I mean, let's start with, uh, you know, how do we actually get data into Thanos? Um, so we're going to start with, you know, where everyone is familiar, I think, with a, with a Prometheus instance putting data into a time series database. This can be anywhere, it can be running on a host somewhere, it can be running in Kubernetes, it can be, yeah, it's just Prometheus doing its thing. Um, and so the, the sort of classic way of running Thanos is actually to run it as a sidecar. So uh, there is this sidecar um, module for Thanos, or sort of mode of operation, um, which basically scoops up the blocks which are coming from Prometheus in the TSDB, um, and then it sort of exposes them via this store API. And the store API is a, a concept which, which sort of Thanos introduced, which basically lets different components plug into other components. So we can plug a query into this sidecar store API, and then we can fetch data from the, the sidecar as if we were fetching it from that Prometheus. And in addition, the sidecar can also put those blobs, uh, blocks into uh, long-term storage, into blob storage, and then we have this long-term retention, which is also promised. So this is really cool if you have multiple clusters. Um, because, you know, let's say we have Switzerland West, um, US East, and uh, Europe North. It's very easy to, you know, make a global view of those metrics just by plugging in one query into all of those sidecar store API endpoints. And at the same time, all of that data gets flushed into long-term storage, um, and it's, yeah, it's a pretty neat system. But of course, sometimes we can't use the sidecar approach. Um, you know, there, there are a number of cases where we can't directly plug into an external um, Prometheus instance. Maybe it's running on a host which we don't have direct access to. Maybe that host only has egress access, for example. We can't get into the host. 
Um, that's actually our situation. We have 10,000 customer hosts out there. We can't plug into them directly. They sort of, they phone home, but we don't talk to them directly, um, at least not for the telemetry. So uh, in this situation, it's not feasible to, you know, to point the query at the Prometheus. So we need something different. And this is where the Thanos receiver comes in. So Thanos receiver is a component which exposes a remote write compatible API. So it's, it's then very simple. We simply point Prometheus at this um, new receive component. We tell it to remote write the metrics there. Prometheus is doing its thing, scraping the data, storing its local TSDB, but we no longer care really about this local TSDB. So we get the metrics via remote write. Um, there is a component called the routing receiver. And this guy is really responsible to validate the metrics which are coming in, just verify that everything looks okay. Um, before sending it on to the ingesting receiver. And this is, this is the component which is actually um, writing those metrics into TSDB format. So the ingesting receiver is um, writing those metrics into a local TSDB, which it also stores. It exposes a store API, which means we can query those metrics as they come in, which is another very powerful thing. We can see the metrics as they are coming in from the external Prometheus. And it also puts those blobs, uh, sorry, again, blocks into blob storage. And so, yeah, we have a similar kind of model for expanding that to multiple clusters or multiple hosts. Um, you know, we can basically point all of the Prometheus at one endpoint, and then we have, again, the global query view and the long-term retention, but just in a different way. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So, our Thanos cluster. We are actually ingesting um, up to 200 million active time series um, at any given time. This is requiring 90 CPUs, uh, almost a terabyte of memory, um, and 400, and sort of the, the, the receive and transmit out of the namespace is 450 megabytes per second, so almost half a gigabyte of data coming in per second, um, and a quarter of a gigabyte of data going out per second. So I mean, it's, it's not Google levels, but for our little uh, company, I think it's pretty respectable. Our setup, um, just to sort of give you a, you know, put it in a picture, we have our fleet of 10,000 edge devices. These are really Linux machines running uh, Prometheus locally. Um, and we also now start to move into um, the cloud. So we have Kubernetes clusters where we run customer workloads um, at multiple points of presence around the world. Um, and these all need to ship their data home. We also have our central Kubernetes cluster based in Switzerland, which is where we are and we run uh, Istio Public Ingress Gateway there. Now, for actually collecting those central, uh, those central metrics, we just run Prometheus with a sidecar because that's like, super easy. Why wouldn't we do that? Um, but for the customer-facing metrics, we need to have this you know, push remote write um, properties. So the, the customer devices push the metrics in. They get sent to an hotel collector where they are um, this, we do client certificate authentication, and then they are forwarded into different kind of pipelines based on uh, the tenancy. Tenancy is a topic we're going to cover here, uh, but you can see the type of metrics that we're collecting there. Proxy, firewall, um, wide area network, SD-WAN, these kind of things. So things we really care about. We want to make sure that we can scale, so to meet our, our workload. If we onboard a new tenant, if, we, if a tenant doubles, quadruples in size, we need to make sure that our metrics backend can meet those. And we also need to make sure that it's, it's resilient. Um, outages are really bad. Like, the customers really complain if the graphs don't look good. Um, this is to be expected, of course. Now, we also want to make sure that uh, we have kind of isolation between tenants so that one guy cannot ruin the party for everyone else. So we have a basic sort of quality of service for each tenant shipping metrics. And we also really care about data availability. Obviously, the long-term storage data, that, that should be available, right? It's in blob storage. But what I'm talking about there is actually the, uh, the latest, the freshest data. This has to be there because here we're sort of using this data to calculate SLOs you know, with recording rules. Um, and if there are gaps in that, this can really be a problem. So um, hopefully that sets the groundwork. Now we're going to dive in a little bit and get sort of slightly more technical. Um, so let's think about how we might deploy Thanos, sort of this, this receiver, and let's take a very naive approach. Let's just deploy this as a, as a deployment, okay? So Kubernetes stateless deployment, um, is this a good idea? The answer is no. So if we have the incoming metrics, what we need to do is, of course, load balance those metrics across this deployment. 
And of course, we have to think, you know, how are we gonna, what's the strategy we use to load balance? Are we gonna do round robin? Are we gonna do randomly, sticky sessions? Maybe sticky sessions sounds like a good idea, right? Um, each receiver is maintaining a local TSDB. And if you know a bit about, you know, the, the sort of the data structure of TSDB, it's actually very bad to have samples kind of randomly distributed between two different TSDBs, okay? TSDB really likes um, consistent deltas between samples. So a load balancer doesn't really work in this case. This is why we have the routing receive component. So now we're gonna take a stateful approach. We're gonna make these guys a stateful set. We're gonna store the local TSDB persistently so that it survives uh, restarts. And the routing receiver, um, we're gonna organize it into a hash ring. So we're gonna organize these guys into a hash ring. Why would we like to do that? <coughs> Let's say that we get um, a label set come in, CPU usage for a given host. What the routing receiver does is it hashes that label set and then it maps it to a given receive replica. Now, this is um, a very good quality because now, every time a sample comes in for that metric, it will end up in the same TSDB. So this is good, it solves that problem of scattered samples between TSDBs. If we have another metric coming in with a different host ID, maybe that gets mapped to a different receive. Maybe it gets mapped to the same one, it doesn't really matter. So it's kind of a way of um, ensuring that we can split the load between the receives, but also make sure that uh, you know, we have consistency within the, the, within the TSDB uh, instances. Now, in this picture, how can we deal with scaling? So if we add another replica to this hash ring, how can we sort of nicely handle this? And also, what happens if a receiver becomes unhealthy? How do we deal with this? So we really need to have a system of hash ring management or something which can manage the hash ring for us. There's a few different ways we can do it. So one way which is very valid is to do sort of a static definition of the hash rings. Um, and this is fine, right? So you can have a Helm chart, you can define how many replicas you need, you can define um, how the hash ring should be set, you can deploy it, and that's fine. But it just means that every time you want to change the hash ring or every time something changes, um, you need to do a new deployment. It's not so terrible. Another option is to use a controller. And so what the controller would do is it would actually watch the replicas in the, um, in, in the receive sort of uh, stateful set. And it would make sure that you know, if you change the number of replicas or if, you, if one of the receives becomes unhealthy, then the, the controller should be able to respond to that. And there is a controller which has been built. Um, it's not part of the core Thanos project. It's part of this observatorium project, but there are a few shared maintainers between the two projects. And so there's this Thanos receive controller. And this is what we use in our production environment to manage the hash rings. So the way it works, um, we deploy the, th the receive controller just as a normal um, you know, stateless deployment. We have the routing receives and the receive hash rings from before. And all we need to do first is to just label um, which hash ring those receives belong to. So we just say you know, hash ring is equal to hash zero. We give this hash ring now a name. And then we set up a very basic config file which says hash ring is hash zero. So this is just saying that we have a hash ring called hash zero. We feed that into the receive controller, it's called base.json. Um, and this receive controller then generates, um, it generates the full hash ring by looking up the endpoints of these receive pods. So that the receive controller is interacting with the Kubernetes API to say, look, I get the pods with this label, I map those endpoints into this hash ring, and then I feed that into the routing receiver, okay? So um, what happens now when we scale? If a new receiver comes along, either from horizontal pod auto scaling or we set the replicas, um, the receive controller will recognize this and it will update that hash ring generated file um, and then the routing receivers will load that in and they will start shipping metrics to the, new, uh, to the new endpoint. What happens if something becomes unhealthy? Again, we have, there is a bit of a, let's say there is a bit of crossover time or a bit of uncertainty between when the Kubernetes API recognizes or re when the kubelet rep recognizes that the pod is unhealthy. It of course depends on how often your health checks are and those settings. But at some point that pod will be taken out of action and the receive controller will recognize that that receiver should be removed from the hash ring. So this is really nice. We have scalability and we have um, resilience of the hash rings. And the key configuration, if you want to do this, um, I would say this is the most important thing to take away. Uh, there is a new algorithm for cons uh, consistent hashing in Thanos. It was, I think, introduced in the last year, I have to check. 
Um, it's called the Kitama hash ring. Previously, these receives were using just a simple hash mod. And of course, with a hash mod, the only argument is the number, you know, the kind of sharding factor. And I think if you've ever worked with this kind of hash ring, you know that if you remove one instance from a hash mod, it kind of scatters everything. So there's no sort of consistency between replicas being added or taken away from the, 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 the pool. The consistent hash ring solves this. Um, we're not going to go into it fully here, but it basically makes the effect of adding in or removing replicas from the, the hash ring much less um, felt. It makes it much more stable. And on the receive controller itself, then you should definitely run with these two config options. So only allow ready replicas. This basically says, okay, if the pod is running, that's not good enough. It also needs to be ready. It sounds obvious, but you, we, we have to configure that. Um, that means the receiver will only be added to the hash ring once it's fully ready, which means the local TSDB has been completely um, you know, created and spun up and it's ready to accept requests. And another one is to allow dynamic scaling. In the default configuration, this receive controller does not um, update when things are taken out of the hash ring. But if you enable this new flag, I think you have to make sure you're on the, one of the latest versions, um, then it will also update this hash ring dynamically. And so this, yeah, if, you, if you're at this point, then I think you can say, you know, this was the end of quite some internal uh, work, let's say, to get these, uh, these hash rings stable. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but, you know, things can still go wrong, right? And of course, what happens is you have a beautiful platform and then you unleash users on it, right? So users are still sending um, metrics to our platform and we don't really have much control over what comes in. So there's something which we call the Perl hash incident internally. And it's pretty simple what happened. Um, somehow, a label value was set to a hash instead of the actual value referenced by the hash. So it's sort of, you forgot to dereference a pointer. This led to a big problem because we suddenly had, you know, once that uh, deployment was live, we suddenly had a very, very, very noisy neighbor within our um, hash ring, okay? So we had a, uh, a huge, this is, basically textbook cardinality explosion. And as we know, Prometheus and Thanos by extension does not like high cardinality um, time series. And so then we very quickly ran into this sort of failure cascade where one receiver keels over, the load gets split to the next two, but of course they're already keeling over and eventually you have a hash ring which is completely unrecoverable. So one troublesome tenant can really lead to a full service outage. This is not ideal. So how can we solve it? Um, the, you know, let's say the obvious or the, the uh, hopefully the obvious way to deal with it is actually just say, okay, the troublesome tenant can get its own hash ring. And this is, um, this is good because then if, if that troublesome tenant starts to make trouble again, um, the outage will be contained to its own hash ring, right? So we still get metrics from 90% of the, of the, you know, the good tenants. Um, but this guy down here, we can go back to the service team and say, hey, look, you're currently not ingesting metrics because you know, you need to go and investigate. So that's good. This is called hard tenancy, where you sort of physically separate. You have physically separate infrastructure for handling different metrics coming in. Um, and to actually create that with the receive controller, it's pretty simple. All you need to do is create a second hash ring in your JSON manifest, and then you need to map tenants. Um, you just need to map the tenants to which hash ring they belong to. And down here, you see we don't map any tenants. This is saying, if you can't find a hash ring for a given tenant, just send it to the default hash ring, okay? So this is like the soft tenancy hash ring where everything will just be mixed together. And this is the dedicated hash ring for the troublesome tenants. Of course, you might not want to juggle, uh, to juggle multiple hash rings. There is, of course, an additional complexity there. You have to manage multiple stateful sets. Um, there is another option, which is called active series limiting. Again, this is a, uh, a relatively recent feature of Thanos, um, I think since 0.28 maybe. Um, but this allows us to actually um, look at the number of series coming in and then to just limit dynamically based on when they get above a certain level. And this is the basic idea. So we have an idea of how many series we can manage, you know, based on our resources which we've deployed in the, res in the receives. Um, and what we need to do is we just need to query what the current metric value is for that head series. Each of the receives, like Prometheus, has a metric called um, head series, uh, or Prometheus time series head, or head time series, something like that. It pops up later. So we can actually count that um, live. And then it's 
we just need to tell the routing receiver to limit if the number of active head series is higher than some value which we configure. Let's see how it looks. Here's our hash ring. Here's our noisy tenant. We have to introduce a new meta monitoring, monitoring query, which is going to fetch those current head series values. And it's a query which looks exactly like this. This is exactly the query which is run. And so in this example, for example, you can see the SDP tenant has 28 million um, head series. The VAN tenant has 23 million head series. Okay? The bandwidth control has 9 million. And so then we just need to configure. We need to tell the routing receiver how it should behave, how it should limit those tenants. So of course, in this case, we're in trouble because SDP is only allowed 2,000 head series. Okay? In this case, we would have a lot of limiting based on SDP. But this is where that sort of tweaking based on your operational knowledge, knowledge comes in. And in this way, we can really shrink the size um, of the metrics coming in. Um, we also return a retriable error to the tenant who is trying to send too many metrics. So we can alert on that. We can, you know, we can go and look as to why that, uh, that situation is starting to happen. And of course, nothing stops us from taking a hybrid approach. So you can have separate hash rings, and you can also um, have active series limiting per hash ring if you want to. And this is actually what we do in production to, um, to basically keep each, each hash ring healthy, um, but also minimize the effect of noisy neighbors. Now this is all well and good. So now we have scalability, we have resilience, and we have, um, let's say, happy customers. But there are still some issues. So in our customer portal, we have graphs and we have metrics. Uh, or graphs which are fed from metrics. And one of those graphs, for example, is availability of a given host. And this is based on a recording rule, which is constantly being evaluated on data which is coming in. Um, and when we have an outage, I mean, it's, it's important because we have SLAs which are you know, related to those outages. So if we have a lot of you know, incorrect outages, then that's not good for us. We have to go and justify to the customer um, that this was not really an outage, it was a metrics problem. So we were, you know, reported, it was reported that there were some uh, spurious outages, let's say, some outages which were not real outages. And so we went and looked into the data, and actually it turned out that we, you know, the, the rules were being evaluated, but there were gaps in those rules. So we had some missed rule evaluations, or we had some time when, you know, data was not there, so the rules could not be evaluated. So what's going on here? Here's our um, setup, right? So let's say that we have data which is required for a given, uh, for a given rule to be evaluated. Um, and that's being hashed, so that's being sent to receiver one, OK? The ruler is picking up the data from receiver one, evaluating the rule, shipping it off into blob storage. Everything is working fine. Now, if receiver one has an issue, of course, that data can no longer be written. And then the ruler can no longer evaluate. It's going to evaluate to some missing or you know, just missing metric. This gives us the gaps in the data um, which, we, which we saw. And of course, you can still have you know, the receive controller working. Um, but there is this period after you know, if, a, if a receive crashes, there is this in-between time. You know, the kubler has to realize that it needs to reboot the pod. It needs to take it out. Um, it's, it's not a perfect system. These, these things don't happen instantaneously. So it can be that a rule is evaluated at the same time as a receive is not available. So we can actually make things better just by setting one config, which is a replication factor. So especially only with the, uh, the receives, so with the, the remote write approach, we can replicate the data which is coming in. And so this is what happens. Um, if we have a replication factor of three, the incoming time series still gets shipped to the same um, pod, but it also gets replicated to two other receives. So we have three copies of the data. And of course, then the ruler can read from those three copies, and this is fine. If one of the receives goes down, then that's OK, because we still have two more copies. So the ruler can still proceed, and it can still evaluate its rules. Everything is fine. So this really in, in, in increases your failure tolerance, or tolerance to sort of pods disappearing, pods not being respons responsive. You have to be careful, um, because with this replication comes this uh, concept of quorum. So for a given replication factor, there is a, you know, just a formula, q equals r over 2 plus 1. So the quorum factor is equal to the replication factor divided by 2 plus 1. I think this is, uh, you know, you've probably seen this before in other, um, other fields. So for example, with our replication factor of three, we have a quorum of two. And what that means is that at least two receives must acknowledge a write in order for that write to have been considered successful. 
So the routing receives will make sure that um, at least two of the receives succeeded. That gives us, you know, we can calculate then what the max unavailable is for a given replication factor, and sort of you can use that to identify, you know, you know what your fault tolerance, tolerance is, um, you can use that to, uh, to plan your deployments. The key thing is that you should ensure that the minimum number of replicas is larger or equal to the replication factor. So that's a, it's, let's say it's a very simple thing you can do, just enable replication, but you should um, consider whether you really need it. In our case, we really need it because the, the rules must be evaluated. We need a very, very high successful rule evaluation. Um, it doesn't actually increase your storage costs because you can dedupe the data later with the compactor. We're not gonna go into that today, there's not enough time. I would love to do a whole talk just on the compactor, maybe next year. Um, but one of the things you can do is use a pod disruption budget, which matches your max unavailable, um, just to make sure that you're kind of resilient in the face of you know, nodes going down, cluster reboots, these kind of things which happen, uh, especially with managed Kubernetes providers. So, everything was good. Um, <laughs> of course, this is how it feels sometimes when you're using the cloud, right? Especially Kubernetes and storage, uh, especially with metrics and we also do logs and these kind of storage costs, they just, they can go up. So it really feels like this, and of course, when your boss checks the Azure budget uh, over breakfast, this can happen. This actually happened. So um, we were asked sort of, um, you know, politely but firmly, if we could have a look at the cloud costs and bring them down. And so we started to investigate. Um, and we really did see sort of a, a big increase in cloud costs over time, which didn't seem to correlate with pure storage, okay? But they were coming from the storage account. And so we traced it down to this component called the compactor. And what it turned out was that the, the cause of the storage cost increase was actually requests to the storage account. So it wasn't pure storage, it was just sort of, you know, write requests, read requests, these kind of things were going up. And they were pretty expensive. And it turned out that this component called the compactor, what it does is it periodically, every five minutes, it goes to the blob storage and it does some sort of, uh, it does a lot of housekeeping. So it does retention, which means it deletes old blocks, it does downsampling, uh, it does compaction of blocks as well. But the key thing is deletion, okay? Oops, I've gone too far. The key thing is deletion. So it will remove blocks which it deems are no longer necessary. And the reason why a block is deemed no longer necessary could be it's been marked for deletion, which is perfectly fine, or it's a partially uploaded block. And a partially uploaded block is just, you know, if a receive has been uploading some data, it's a big amount of data. If it gets interrupted during that process, then you have a kind of unfinished block in blob storage. So this is what a partially uploaded block is. Um, it usually gets solved when the receiver reboots because then it can kind of finish uploading that block, but it gets put into a new block ID. So you tend to have these, you know, blocks hanging around. So I'm gonna just whiz through some logs. I, you don't have to read all the logs. But this, I just want to take you on the journey of, of, of how we, we track this down. I've got three minutes, let's say. So, what usually happens? The compactor realizes that we have um, a block it needs to remove. This is partial equals one. It will say it found the block, and then it marked the block for deletion, and then it deleted the block. And we see this sort of happy path. With the puzzle, uh, so the puzzle is, why is this partial is going up and up and up? The number of partial blocks is keeping on increasing, which means we have a bunch of garbage, basically, in the blob storage. And it looks like the compactor is actually marking these blocks for deletion, but they're not being deleted. So what's going on? When you go to the block storage, um, you actually see this nice directory view. And, uh, you know, it looks like you've got files, you've got directories, you can sort of sift through them like this. This is actually a lie, okay? So this is not real. This is um, a facade, which the cloud providers do to make you feel at home, right? Um, it's actually, you know, block storage is a flat namespace. And what that means is that everything is a file, there's no directories. At least that's how it should be. That's how we expect it to be. So it's really an illusion, and it, the way to say is, you know, if you were to have files like this on your, on your local machine, it would look like this. A hierarchical namespace is what we expect, right? This is a kind of standard tree structure um, with directories, and we can move between these directories, and yeah, it's all understood. So our cloud provider, Azure, actually has this hierarchical namespace, which can be enabled for blob storage. It turned out it was enabled by default, by our own automation. So our Terraform pipelines were causing us issues. 
So when we went to these blocks, which were partially uploaded blocks, they just looked like empty directories. And this didn't make sense because we're like, well, that doesn't make sense for, for flat kind of blob storage, right? So what was actually happening, this was kind of a ghost left behind from Thanos deleting blobs. And then the hierarchical namespace just left behind these, these, uh, these, these empty directories. And of course, Thanos, there's no way to delete that, right? So it was really strange. It's really this situation, right? We just have two empty directories in blob storage. So this, I mean, the, the picture kind of sums it up. The, the cloud was um, charging us for these, uh, for these delete requests to completely non-existent blocks. And this was really thousands of delete requests every five minutes, which just got worse and worse and worse. The take home message for the blob storage is, if you're using Thanos, if you're using, you know, if you make sure you understand which settings have been enabled, um, because this really led to like 86% reduction in our storage account costs, just from transactions. It was crazy. So summing up, I've, uh, there's four minutes left for questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much. This has been uh, our journey with the Thanos Right Path and also some fun um, you know, deep dives into cloud provider features. And there's my talk. Thank you very much. Multiple Thanos receivers writing data into uh, blob storage. Um, is there a way to choose uh, only to write from one of the receivers instead of multiple? Because when we are doing replication, uh, most of the work done by Compactor is just deduplicating whatever was replicated, right? So yeah. how can we avoid that? There's no way to say, OK, this receiver will write to blob storage. This receiver won't. And that won't work, I think, because it's, it's kind of, you can't really govern how those series are, 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 are hashed between the receivers, right? You can't guarantee that one will always be there. Because as it moves in and out, the consistent hashing will update. And so you can't really do that. You, you have to do the deduplication in the compactor. I think there's no way around it. Um, I have two questions. So first the one is, have you cleaned your data before you send to the receiver? Uh, clean, clean the data, like a clean data. the data before we send it to the receiver. Like a recording door, and then you only scrap the um, the data. We don't do any cleaning, but we have so the data goes through like a uh, collector pipeline, where we sort of stamp it with uniform metadata and these kind of things. Currently, so you I basically send the, all the raw data from the Prometheus to the receiver? Yeah, okay, exactly. So have yeah. you ever considered about using the uh, Prometheus Federation? So what's the difference between the Federation Prometheus and the Thanos? So, okay, the, the reason we have to do it with Thanos is because we want to collect the data from all these different Prometheus, right? Or do you mean to actually use a central Prometheus instead of Thanos? Um, so Prometheus Federation also has ability to scrap from the different cluster. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's a little bit similar to how Thanos can uh, receive the, from the different clusters. So I was wondering what's the difference between the two and uh, why you choose the Thanos? Okay, so um, the, one of the reasons for using Thanos is because, um, especially for the long-term retention. So for the long-term retention of the Prometheus data, you really must use Thanos. Um, just because if you need to go beyond a few months, it's, it's not feasible. Um, to query those data from Prometheus. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to think about that a bit longer if you just wanted to use base Prometheus to, to receive the data. Okay, cool, thanks. So what would hey. you consider truly high cardinality? Uh, I saw two million, uh, that seems like obscene as far as cardinality, but if we were looking to track cardinality explosion, what would you say was a, a good uh, starting point? I mean, it depends how much you want to scale. It, it really depends on your use case. For example, I mean, it's not, it's not related to Thanos, but um, we also run Loki. So Loki, again, has this you know, cardinality with chunks and stuff. For Loki, we, have, we hit almost a million streams, right? which for Loki is pretty huge. But for our use case, it was absolutely necessary because 
we needed to slice by application as well as by host, right? So we needed kind of horizontal across hosts and per host. Um, I mean, it's, that's, that's a hard question to answer because it will depend on, you know, your, your system, right? Um, Yeah, that's true. It's that's that's that sums it up. <laughs> um, so I had a question regarding uh, scaling out. So what would you consider the the bottleneck? So when you're adding more and more tenants, what's the first thing you're like? Okay, now this is the component in Thanos that we have to think about and the receives yeah. for sure. The receivers. Yeah, the receivers. Yeah. Okay. So those guys, they you need to be really careful with them. If they if they hit their memory limits you can really have this cascading failure situation. And that's very, so we have like alerts on sort of 70% of the maximum head series, for example. So and what we want to- So the time series, the, the unique time series is what you're gonna Exactly, monitor, yeah, know? yeah, 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 exactly. Nice. No worries. Hey. Hi, uh, I have a question regarding uh, cardinality limiting. So you said uh, there is a component which queries just head series, and then it says that cardinality is exceeded or not. So does it mean that if cardinality exceeded, the whole data stream is like blocked? Yes, so effectively that's a way you can introduce a cardinality limit because you know, each, each individual, um, you know, let's say each individual label set would be a separate TS, uh, time series. So that's one way that, yeah, that's exactly how you can do that. Okay, is there a way to block only a new time series? So for example, we have like one million for this tenant and then it exceeds like by adding 1,000 of new series, so you reject only those 1,000. Um, hmm. I don't think so because it, it, so it's basically uh, what's in the current head block, so that two it, within this two hours. So basically, you know, we usually see this sort of ramping up and then a cut and then it ramping up again. So effectively, once you get to that threshold and you're ramping up, then you cut everything after that, and you can't say, you know, you can't really distinguish which series you're going to cut or not. It's just about for a pure okay. number. Thank you. No worries. Good. Thank you very much.